welcome. My name is Joyce Rosenthal. I'm assistant professor of urban planning in the Department of Urban Planning and Design here at the GSD, and really happy to have here with us tonight Douglas Allers of the Harvard Kennedy School and Miho Mazaru of the uh, GSD. Did I get that? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is an important discussion for planners and designers. Unlike people, cities rarely die once they've been created. They can, however, be grievously injured, um, but then they can heal and recover, and that's of central concern to planners and designers in that recovery process, and in the process, hopefully, to ensure they're resilient to natural shocks and disasters. So this summer, I had the pleasure of working with Doug Allers as an advisor for the Environew Project, which is a national project of several organizations, including the Salvation Army and FedEx and the Harvard Kennedy School and the GSD, aimed at enhancing urban resiliency in several countries, several cities, rather, around the country. And we have some colleagues here tonight with us. I want to recognize Ethan Frizzell, uh, Major Ethan Frizzell, in, based in Florida, and Alex Miller. Um, with Envirenew, coming all the way from New Orleans to um, hear this event. So this event also marks the beginning of a new Master of Design Studies track um, for the GSD and anticipatory spatial practices. So before introducing Doug and Miho, I'd like to just frame a few thoughts on that new track and raise a few questions that they may begin to address. Um, there's a lot of complicated, complex questions involved in urban resiliency and post-disaster recovery, but at least we can start, and I think that's really in the spirit of the new track. Um, so as many of us have seen in our work, rapid urbanization has brought increased millions of people living on floodplains, earthquake faults, coastal areas, and other precarious hazardous regions, as well as the one billion global slum dwellers that already live in precarious and hazardous regions or hazardous conditions due to lack of sanitation and water supply. So this extended urbanization currently is adding to existing development patterns that have often amplified natural hazards and created new risks where ones didn't even exist before. As one result, if you look in the literature, you can see very clearly that the cost of natural disasters, whether that's economic costs, human costs, uh, measured in lives or billions of dollars, has increased exponentially in the United States and internationally just in the last few years. So basically, anticipatory practices mean smart planning and design for urban resiliency with a two-fold set of goals. When possible, we're seeking to prevent, mitigate, forestall the human and social costs of disasters and to enable long-term recovery in communities following disasters through planning and design work with communities before events. Because ultimately, disasters are inevitable. Even if you plan for them well, we know that San Francisco is going to have that big earthquake sometime. Um, many seismologists believe that'll happen within the next generation, and there will be consequences. But how can they prepare beforehand? So that's really at the heart of the work that um, both Miho and Doug do, and I'm very pleased to have them here. And in that sense, it really turns out that anticipatory practices are essentially cognitive acts on the part of planners and designers and the communities that are now at risk. As Elaine Scarry points out in her very good book, Thinking in Emergency, the goal for thinking and, pr and practice is to, whenever possible, really obviate the need for emergency response to the extent we can beforehand. I mean, for example, the number one predicted disaster in the United States was a major hurricane striking New Orleans. And this was so anticipated um, that this risk was so foreseen that there were frequent exercises of practices and emergency preparations that somehow never accounted for a very sizable portion of the population that couldn't drive out of the city in case of an evacuation at a major event. So even with preparations, sometimes we're missing the vulnerable communities. And you know what we want to ask ourselves is what can we learn from these prior experiences and take into our practice to respond earlier before events. At the same time, we're very much entering an era of climate instability for which the international community is not prepared yet for these impacts, especially in changes in food systems and agriculture due to droughts and changing weather patterns that we see globally. 
So our focus in this new track of the GSD is not emergency response or the short-term humanitarian emergency response, which are really the essential first steps of recovery, but it's linked to a longer-term recovery process with communities and to mitigate or prevent socially constructed disasters. Um, so along those lines, I pose some questions for our speakers tonight. And these are all complicated questions. I know you won't answer <laughs> every one of them, but we can get started and have the discussion with you afterwards. Um, so what have you seen work best in the communities that you've worked in to support strong social, ecological, and private sector networks that may be resilient to hazards and extreme events? Um, what are the best practices for pre-event planning for post-disaster community-based recovery? Um, and realizing that's a very place-based function, it's not a cookie-cutter cut function, but how do we bring back housing, jobs, and infrastructure at the same time? As planners have seen in Haiti, it really doesn't work, say, for example, to bring back housing without the um, infrastructure there to support it, or jobs to support the populations. So these are a starting point for our discussion of anticipatory practices. And finally, how best to build the long-term capacity for resilience in communities through community-based planning and design? One finding that already emerges from these initial questions um, that we've asked ourselves over the summer is planners and designers of all types are really challenged to work together, that we have that responsibility and ability to work together to create more resilient neighborhoods and cities. Um, so the format for tonight is, um, first our speakers will each discuss their work for 30 minutes. Um, I will introduce Doug um, Allers first and then Miho. Um, and they've worked in post-Katrina New Orleans and post-Tsunami Japan. With the remaining time, we have a panel discussion based on your questions and responses to their presentation. So um, I'd like to first introduce Doug and Miho, and then I think we'll hold the questions until after their presentations are done and then have a full panel discussion. So we're really pleased to have them both here. Doug Allers is an adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and teaches a course on the management of disaster recovery, which blends case teaching with field research a very popular class with our students, I may add. Um, he founded the Kennedy School Broadmoor Project, a collaborative redevelopment effort between Katrina-devastated Broadmoor, New Orleans neighborhood and the Kennedy School, and is working now with the city of San Francisco to prepare to recover faster after a disaster strikes. Doug has been a fellow at the Preventative Defense Project at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation, He's a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and a fellow at the Shorenstein Center for Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard. That's just some of his affiliations. I've cut out <laughs> the rest of the long list. He's a co-founder of Modern Media and is on the Smithsonian Institution's National Board, among other boards. He attended Simon Rocks College and received his bachelor's degree from the University of Rhode Island and his master's in journalism from Louisiana State University. So thank you for being here. Um, Miho Mazaru is currently a lecturer in the Landscape Architecture Department at the GSD. She has also taught at MIT and the University of Toronto. She's a landscape architect and an architect too. Um, Miho received her Bachelor of Arts with high honors in sculpture and environmental science at Wesleyan University. She was awarded the Janet Darling Webel Prize and the Charles Eliot Traveling Fellowship at the Harvard GSD, where she received her Master in Architecture and her Master in Landscape Architecture with distinction. So she's very smart. <laughs> and she is currently competing her book, Preemptive Design, Disaster and Urban Development Along the Pacific Ring of Fire, which includes case studies on infrastructure, public space, and planning strategies for regions where earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions are a threat. And we're all looking forward to reading that. Her previous work also dealt with disaster prevention has been exhibited at many museums and universities, and she has worked in the Office of Metropolitan Architecture in Rotterdam as an associate, and also in the Office of Shiguro Ban and the Office of Dan Kiley. This summer, she brought a group of GSD students to help with the reconstruction efforts in Japan in the Miyaga Prefecture, and I think you may be discussing that work, so thank you, Miho, we're delighted you're here. So I'll ask Doug to discuss his work first, and thank you. <laughs> 
Well, good evening, everyone. Um, and I'm gonna, I think we need to bring the lights down for the main room here. Um, so I'm going to talk. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, resiliency and very specifically about community-based resiliency um, and community-based recovery. Um, so all, anytime one has to give a talk about resiliency, it always begins with the definition of what the, the term is. So I will uh, throw one up. The United Nations uh, uh, definition for their uh, uh, disaster risk reduction strategy is the ability of a system community or society um, exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate, and recover from the effects of a hazard. Uh, this is a fairly standard uh, definition, uh, but this is my definition of what resiliency is. This is the tsunami in Aceh 2004, Indonesia. And on the left is the international community, NGOs, et cetera, planning. The big issue was how to restore livelihoods, how to get the boats back in the water. And that's the international community all trying to figure out how to get the boats in the water. And this uh, photograph on the right was taken the same exact week, and it is the villagers actually getting the boats back in the water. And that is the definition of a resilient community. Um, so if we actually look at, uh, at disasters and disaster recoveries, we have to start to think of a community as a set of interlinked uh, um, and interacting interdependent systems, uh, economic subsystem, uh, social, physical systems, all, all working in interaction, and shocks coming in from, from the outside. Uh, and the real question about resiliency in the community is how a community fares against those, those shocks. So one way to look at this is sort of the Swiss cheese model, that, that a, a layered approach to resiliency, where each layer of Swiss cheese sort of lets things through. And if all of the layers actually, if the holes all line up, then uh, the disaster succeeds in, in getting through. And each layer can sort of vary from uh, either very holy to very solid of letting things through, so you have a very layered approach. Prevention, uh, basically about avoidance of the problem, mitigation about hardening of, of the, the assets. Flexibility, the ability to absorb uh, the, the, the shocks to the system, and redundancy uh, to uh, get around it. And, and very often this is what we think of in terms of resiliency, most of the things that one can do in advance of a disaster. Uh, to prevent it or, or uh, mitigate against it. Um, but I actually want to focus on this side over here, which is uh, the issue of what happens when stuff gets through, and very specifically, the class of disasters I focus on, catastrophic disasters, are ones uh, where often the, the sort of things that have been in place uh, to resil against a disaster have failed. And over here, it's really the issue of recovery and the real key for resilience on this side of the equation is adaptation and how a community adapts. And that, that picture before of the community rolling the, and pushing the, uh, roll, using logs to roll the boats back into the water is a perfect example of adaptation. Uh, disaster recovery or, um, and resiliency is one of those, those sort of squishy terms, though, that it is, um, it's tough to define and it's tough to measure, uh, but you know it when you see it. So I actually want to sort of go through a case study, the, the uh, Broadmoor neighborhood in New Orleans, which is an example of a community that showed great resilience after Katrina. Uh, this is a map of New Orleans and the Broadmoor neighborhood, sort of a pie wedge shaped, is in the center of the city, uh, shown in orange. And this is sort of the topography of the area. You'll notice that uh, this is the Mississippi River, and then the, the natural banks of the Mississippi River uh, create basically a bowl effect. And Broadmoor, which is the area in green here, is at the bottom of the bowl of a bowl-shaped city. Um, so what happened is uh, that bowl filled up with water between four and eight feet of water in the Broadmoor neighborhood. Um, and unfortunately, the water was brackish water. It uh, essentially, when the levees breached, it was the Gulf of Mexico that entered Broadmoor uh, and, and filled it. And the uh, 
you can imagine it sat, the water sat in Broadmoor for about two to two and a half weeks. Uh, imagine a cardboard box sitting in a bathtub overnight, and then imagine a house sitting in uh, eight feet of water for two and a half weeks, and the end result is virtually all of the building structures in Broadmoor were uh, red tagged. They had to be, uh, they were, none of them were immediately uh, inhabitable. They all had to have major uh, renovation to be able, and repairs to be able to, uh, um, to get in. And it was not just uh, homes, schools. This is the Andrew Wilson School in, in Broadmoor. That's what it it looked like it was churches and places of, of worship. It was hospitals. This is the hospital in Brummer. It looks fine from the outside because the water damage was only uh, eight feet deep, but it actually, all the mold and issues required the entire gutting of the hospital. It was also, it was basically a hellish place in the disaster and was the place of many um, euthanasia cases where patients were uh, put to, uh, were euthanized. Um, uh, it was also commercial uh, buildings, offices, industrial buildings, and of course, houses. Uh, so these are some of the house damage in, in the Broadmoor neighborhood. And one of the interesting things of being at the bottom of the bowl, it was not near the levee breach. So the Lower Ninth Ward or Lakeview, for example, uh, had white water, water as the levee broke, water rushed in and the force of the water swept homes off their foundations, et cetera. Being in the bottom of the bowl, uh, two and a half miles from the nearest levee, it was much slower to fill. So you end up having structures that are fairly, uh, fairly intact, uh, maybe some issues with, with foundations. Uh, there's an example of, of one sort of leaning there. But generally speaking, you had buildings that were intact that, that um, uh, were structurally okay. But the interiors, of course, quite a mess. Um, and one of the biggest issues is the mold, that all of these issues, uh, all of these uh, structures filled with black mold and which meant that everything had to be gutted out of the house, all the possessions uh, uh, piled out in the front yard, as well as all of the things, sheetrock, uh, lumber, everything stripped out. And because it was brackish water, all of the systems, you had corrosion for everything, so all the electrical systems, plumbing systems, gas, uh, heating, uh, uh, air conditioning had to be removed. And what you end up, basically end up with is the shell of the house that is fully gutted, and then you have to mold remediate and then re begin uh, construction. So you really have a two-step process. The gutting of an entire city, uh, in this case, the gutting of the entire neighborhood, which takes time and effort and energy and the debris removal for, for everything, and then the, the repairs that, that happened. Soon after um, uh, Katrina, the mayor of New Orleans created the Bring New Orleans Back Commission to come up with a recovery plan for the city. Uh, the urban planning uh, commi committee of that came up with what is known as the Green Dot Plan. Uh, New Orleans had been shrinking in population pre-Katrina, and there were forecasts that many of the displaced residents would not return. Uh, so the issue was about potentially shrinking the footprint of the city. Uh, so they came up with the map with these green dots, and it has been, uh, it's now called the Green Dot Plan, or um, and those were areas that were uh, suggested to not rebuild. Um, actually, it was, uh, the real challenge was thrown out is those neighborhoods would have to prove their viability, uh, which meant 50% of the population return, otherwise they would, the neighborhoods would be raised. Um, this one, of course, is Broadmoor. Um, you might expect that Broadmoor would react negatively to, to that, and indeed they did. They started by staging a rally on the neutral ground or the median of the, the, the main road, where they basically said, over our dead bodies, will you take our, our houses? Um, and so the organization, this, this sort of spark for, for change began in this thing, this threat to the community, started to galvanize the community into becoming organized. And what was really fascinating is the, uh, Broadmoor is a very mixed neighborhood, but it's mixed uh, in terms of, uh, there's an affluent white section and a, a very poor African-American section and sort of a middle income section. 
uh, and most people had not um, uh, really crossed boundaries in terms of socioeconomic uh, interchange between folks of different uh, classes or, or in terms of races. And all of a sudden, uh, people started to come together as a, as a community, uh, black and white, rich and poor, across all of those, those lines, and started to really get organizing. Of course, they started to do the, uh, you know, the obligatory protest and demonstration on the steps of City Hall. Um, but they also did, uh, in, it is New Orleans, so they did all kinds of other ways to organize and get uh, the community mobilized uh, using things like brass bands and the second line, which is a New Orleans tr tradition, uh, to get the community engaged and to get residents who aren't traditionally have had a hearing. There's actually in New Orleans very, um, uh, very little history of community engagement in, in things. It's not a terribly active uh, city, or at least wasn't pre-Katrina. Now it's extremely uh, engaged communities throughout the city. Um, also used the faith community to be very much involved in uh, the process. And one of the things in New Orleans was this blurring between the religious community and and the, the non-religious community that it basically fused as, as one in, in terms of community. Um, and then, of course, there was leadership. This is Latoya Cantrell. She's sort of the uh, one of the leaders of Broadmoor that emerged out of it. She's like many leaders that um, emerged out of Katrina. Uh, to, to lead the city and the recovery. Over time, uh, recovery started to become more organized. They started to rent a tent and rent a generator. There was no electricity, so, uh, and heaters and rent chairs and microphones and sound systems and, and have agendas and have meetings and start to invite the press and things like that to, to start to, to get organized. And out of that organization and those initial meetings, they came up with some goals and this, or some values for, for how to lead the recovery. And I would say this is probably the most important thing that the community did in terms of the recovery to begin with, with at all, of all of the things that they did, was create um, the set of values. And the first one is the right of self-determination. No outside experts were going to come in and tell Broadmoor what their future was going to be. Um, the second was right of return, which was that the priority was to the residents who had lived there prior to uh, had the, the right to, to come back and live in their, their community. Um, accountability trans, uh, and transparency, following best pra practices, self-sustaining, collaborative partnerships, diversity, affordability, being realistic and uh, pragmatic, being actually incremental in their approach. They knew that whatever their plan and vision for the future was, that it had to be something that they could, could accomplish. Um, they also realized that they couldn't do it alone, that they needed partnerships to, to do this. So they created this pedal diagram, uh, putting themselves at the, the center, obviously, and realizing that uh, they needed to build partnership networks in all of these areas, the citizens themselves creating networks and, uh, and partners within the community of linking the capacities and capabilities that existed in the community that might have not been aligned previously and putting those together. Um, they did not shy away from private developers. It's interesting that government is only one pedal. They were not looking for government to come in and rebuild their, their community. Uh, obviously, the private sector the faith community, and then universities, including um, uh, the work that Harvard has done as a, a partner to the project. Uh, it's an interesting list of, of partners, everything from the Salvation Army to Shell to the Carnegie Corporation to Rebuilding Together. Um, the second piece, as, as the community started to really now move into the phase of that sort of initial organizing to really getting organized as a, a community, doing true community organizing, and the first thing they did was create a block captain program, which was to appoint a captain for each block to both gather information from the community, the best way to know what's going on with all the displaced residents that are, that are scattered across the country is by the residents who are in the, each of the blocks, each of the neighbors who, who know each other, feed that information back up the chain, but also then use that block captain program to drive information back out to all of those displaced residents and provide support and services and, and things, especially as people start to come back uh, 
or, or trying to figure out how to come back is to supply them with, with that thing. It seems like a little simple thing, but it's probably one of, it was one of the most important things of getting the mass of the population of Broadmoor to be able to, to return to, uh, to the neighborhood. They also started to form an organizational structure and they started to form committees. Uh, the Broadmoor Improvement Association, sort of the overarching organization, uh, and then they set up a uh, media committee because they realized that PR and marketing of all of this, changing the perception was key to, to all of this. Um, the, uh, I'll point out that they set up a repopulation committee. I've looked at literally thousands of recovery plans for disasters all over the world. And this is the only plan that has ever used a repopulation committee uh, uh, as, as part of the planning process. That, and that committee purely focused on getting the people back. Um, and then, of course, the revitalization committee, which breaks down into your fairly standard um, uh, uh, sets of, of other committees, uh, as you can see. Um, the neighborhood also realized that it had a problem, that each of these areas, uh, this area here is white and affluent, this area is um, African American and average uh, about 24% overall for Bromer, 24% of households have an annual household income of less than $10,000 a year. So this is hard poverty over here, and this is fairly mixed in, in this area. And they realized if they brought everyone together into uh, meetings to start discussing these issues, people were just going to talk past each other. Um, so they set up subcommittees, uh, subgroups, for each of these areas to have to facilitate the conversation about recovery in each of these uh, subgroups separately. And uh, so they set up uh, had subgroup meetings every week um, for uh, about five months. Um, and each subgroup met uh, weekly and each of the groups meeting separately, but they all talked on the same issue, let's say housing or education or crime, et cetera, uh, on the same week. And about every three weeks, they would come together for a community-wide meeting. Uh, so you had this process of having things being, being discussed uh, in the subgroups, and, and the meetings took on very different styles. In the white affluent area, it was very parliamentary procedures and things like that. In the, in the um, section B, the, the uh, uh, more poor section, it was actually more like a potluck dinners and things like that. Um, the key is they managed it incredibly well, where issues that were discussed in the subgroup meetings were then uh, brought to the um, uh, to the community wide meetings where they would be voted on for uh, and approved as part of the, the plan or uh, et cetera. Uh, but the key there was that they only approved the things that had that they knew that there was consensus across all the sub subgroups where they knew that they actually would get approval. But they didn't shy away from or hide from the issues where they, they didn't have consensus. The agenda for, for the, the community-wide meetings was such that they would say, here are the issues that we are not in agreement on yet, and they'd go through them. But they said, we're not going to discuss them here tonight. We're going to take them back to each of our subcommittee groups, and we will work them. And then, of course, there was a lot of shuttle diplomacy back and forth to uh, to, to broker deals. Um, and it, uh, it really worked because other neighborhoods in New Orleans actually had factions split off, especially the affluent factions sort of going off and saying, well, hey, we'll take care of ourselves and you guys are on your own. So it, it actually worked really well. The, the second piece is they knew they had to put together a plan, uh, a recovery plan, a revitalization plan, a master plan. Uh, for the, for the community, but they needed a planning process, so they came up with a planning process that essentially mirrors those phases that we, that we sort of talked about, the initial impetus for change, that sparking of the thing, the neutral ground rally, the meetings in the tents, the establishing of the block captain programs, then the community organizing, the outreach, community leadership, setting up formal committees and, and setting up the subgroups. Um, 
and then the, sort of moving into the community meeting uh, phase of getting the uh, scoping the problems, coming up with solutions and ideas for, for, for things. And then the fourth phase really being actually sitting down to do the planning and drafting the, the actual plan. Uh, and they had meetings, not just a few meetings, but a lot of them. And not all of them were business. Some were, they understood that in the midst, so in the midst of literally devastation, um, they decided to throw uh, their annual Broadmoor Fest festival because rebuilding it was not just about rebuilding the physical built environment, it was about rebuilding the social systems and, and uh, uh, as well. Uh, it had to be a place that people wanted to live, so they started to do it. This is a double wide trailer on the campus of, or on the parking lot of, of the uh, Annunciation Church. It became the uh, hub for activity for the community. It was basically the only functioning thing in the community for about a year and a half. Um, and it became both the hub for all the planning activities and the planning meeting as they put together the Broadmoor Revitalization Plan, but it also became the social hub. Uh, and actually the planning process, the community planning process became a social process. It became incredibly therapeutic for people to be able to work through trauma and issues of, you know, when you've lost control, lost everything and, and have the sense of, of life submitting out of control, the actual best way to do something about it is a planning process where you're sitting there actually talking about and planning for, for the, the future. But it also helped repair and build the social fabric of the, the community and the social networks that had been torn asunder and helped to build the support system, the social support systems that were absolutely fundamental in being able for people to put their individual lives back to, together and put those supports in place. Um, this is a list of the meetings that they had. They had 145 meetings in total during, uh, from uh, starting about uh, February 1st to, um, uh, to uh, July 17th when they finished drafting and released their, their plan. Um, I'll actually go back for a second. The, uh, what's interesting is somewhere along the lines, the city actually uh, city Council said, I think we'll, we'll actually have a, a plan, uh, start a planning process. And they sent a planning team out to Broadmoor to talk to them. And Broadmoor asked, uh, well, how many times will your planning team come meet with us and get our feedback and input? And they said, well, four times during the planning process. And Broadmoor said, we do that in, you know, this week we'll be doing more than those four, four meetings. Um, one of the key things was actually coming up and setting the priorities for the, the community. Um, the other thing is that they started to get actually, the more they started to get organized, the more they really got into this, the more they became sophisticated. Partly is they started to build on those partnership networks that they were bringing resources in for, but partly they were building the skills and capacity as they, they went in the, the community. So one of the things they needed to do was engage the displaced residents. I mean, remember most of residents are still living outside of the area. Many of them are out of contact. And if you're really going to do true community engagement and true community planning, you cannot just ignore 80% of the, the, the folks, especially the ones least able to come back. Uh, so reaching out to them was important. They went to the national change of address list, which uh, if you move and you need to, uh, uh, get your FEMA benefits or your uh, things, you, you put a change of address in, and they uh, were able to do mailings. Ultimately reached about 80% of the, the residents were able to find and, and, um, and uh, re-engage 80% of the, the residents in the, the process. Also, they understood that perception was a huge issue. Remember, they'd just been identified as the place to be bulldozed. Um, the confidence that they could be rebuilt was pretty low. So they uh, actually used, one of the partners was Digitas, a Boston-based uh, marketing firm. Uh, and they did uh, banners for all the lampposts, t-shirts, lawn signs, et cetera, to change the perception. Uh, Broadmoor was a masters at communication. They realized they had to market this like it was a new subdivision or a new development. Um, they were marketing for, their community and they were marketing for their lives. Part of that was to get the investors and the, the outsiders uh, to, to buy into it. Some was to change the perception of government 
that Broadmoor should actually exist. But a lot of it was actually to convince the residents themselves that Broadmoor was going to come back and that you needed, that it was a viable place to invest your time and energy and, and return to. Um, so this is an example of the long time. I, I should go back. They actually used, the, the strategy that they used was, this was about a year after the, um, uh, the elections in the Ukraine, the orange revolution, uh, and the color revolutions, and they borrowed the, the literally borrowed the exact tactics um, from the uh, from the color revolutions, uh, and created everything. I mean, you went around uh, not just Broadmoor, but around New Orleans and saw the green, co-opting the green of the green dot, um, and uh, it really changed perception. So, in the year from uh, a year after they uh, they were labeled with the green dot as uh, as unviable. Uh, a year later, they were actually being held up by city government and, and the media and everyone as the darling of recovery, of the, one of the, the sort of stars of, of recovery. So they really were able to change the perception. And that was key to it, and it was very conscious. Sometimes perception being out in front of the actual reality of the recovery. Um, uh, and they had meetings, as I said. Uh, Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of meetings uh, discussing and debating their, their future. It, as I said, it was incredibly important. The resilience came from the community itself becoming engaged in planning and figuring out and investing in uh, owning their own future. What you'll see here is, you, you know, there is no government here. There is no waiting for government to, to come and solve the, the problem. And they're not asking for government. They know the transition, the most important thing was they made a transition probably in March or April of 2006 in, the, in this process to a recovery is up to us and we own recovery. This is our recovery and only we can actually recover our own community. Now, government obviously has to be an incredible partner in that. But what's amazing is once they changed to that, that thing, they became actually, they figured out how to be a good partner with government as opposed to going and just demanding. They figured out how to lobby, how to act. Um, and in fact, actually, they hired a lobbyist uh, only for about six months, mostly for, at the state level. but. Who's ever heard of a neighborhood hiring a lobbyist? Um, uh, the, and then sort of they moved to the, the next phase, which was the planning phase itself, actually putting together the, the plan. Now, so you have these subgroups meeting every week, going through, discussing the issues, the problems, defining the problems, coming up with suggested solutions. You have the overarching, the, the um, uh, every couple of weeks, the city, uh, the uh, neighborhood-wide um, meetings where things are brought together. And then you have those committees that are actually out doing, sort of taking those ideas and doing drilling down and trying to, to, to figure it all out. Um, and then those, uh, and what would happen is basically ideas would come from the subgroups and, um, and the, the larger uh, uh, group. Community-wide group and filter down to and be worked by the committees, but, and then the committees would then also send things back up to the subgroups and to the community-wide and say, "Okay, what do you think about this, et, et cetera?" Um, so you had a ton of planning meetings that were very detailed uh, kinds of, of things, tackling everything from. How do we deal with broken street lights to how do we deal with uh, clogged drains to what should education in the school be and to infrastructure issues? Uh, how do we get Entergy to invest in a new gas system because half the neighborhood is still without gas? Um, and again, just countless, countless, countless meetings on going through the, the planning process. Um, some of which, Broadmoor also, it is New Orleans after all, would have fun. So it was potluck meeting. Again, this was a social event. So as much as planning, this is also about building social capital and building community. Um, 
I actually talked to, to Loy, Latoya Cantrell soon in this process and said, well, you've successfully built the neighborhood. Now all you have to do is build the buildings. Um, the, and of course, they actually had to do things. So what they did, and they didn't really have the expertise to do this, so they hired SQ Dumez Ripple to come in and do uh, actually work on the urban urban plans. The difference being that they hired, the community hired the urban planners and the community were the clients for the urban planners. Um, and it really changed the dynamic. It was an incredible model of how to, how to make it work. And some of the things, some of the ideas that came up in the community were, came out of the, uh, uh, all of the ideas came out of the, the community itself. So this is the kitchen table in the double wide trailer where the education corridor was born. It's um, the, the Broadmoor decided, the residents decided that, that education was an economic opportunity. It was all key, tied to education in um, the community and they wanted to build both the um, physical heart of the community as well as the conceptual heart of the community around education. That was the basis for, for rebuilding. And uh, they basically used the, the Nexus uh, model, uh, which is basically co-locating all of the services and entities uh, uh, together. And some of that is about sort of co-locating uh, daycare with senior centers, with the schools, with the YMCA and recreation facilities, et cetera. But it's also about the, the integration of the programming across all of those so that you end up with programming uh, that is, uh, is completely interdependent, essentially the Harlem Children's Zone sort of, sort of model to, to the approach. Um, and unfortunately, they were not, um, able to uh, actually have a campus. So they used a district concept of a few square blocks uh, linked by uh, pedestrian friendly uh, streets. Um, but the real difference here is that what Broadmoor knew is they needed to control all the institutions. They knew they needed to control the school, the library, the recreation facilities, the senior centers, the community center. And they set out to, to do that. So in the midst of all of this, in the midst of devastation, the, the uh, community decided to start a charter school. Now, starting a charter school is a two-year, three-year process in, a, in the most affluent and functioning of communities. But in the midst of devastation, it's unheard of. And Broadmoor, uh, from the day they decided to, uh, to do it, which was a unanimous vote by, by all the residents, followed by a question from the audience that said, what is a charter school? Uh, so they started at that point and opened the doors 15 months later. Um, the, uh, but the key to, the, to the, their future and their design of all of this is that they run the school, they run the um, uh, they partner with the YMCA to do recreation programs in the, the uh, neighborhood, but under their control. They run the library and the community center. They run the after school programs and the day camps and the senior programs. A lot of times it's with partners. So they'll partner with faith based groups and organizations or nonprofits. But it's all driven by the community and it's all vetted by the community and coordinated by the community. Um, and so that all of the programming from all of these things work together and support each other uh, in, the, in the process. A um, few visions. So they decided to build a, a school. I actually don't have the, a picture of the school, but it, there is a gorgeous $30 million <laughs> school that has been, that has been built. Um, but even there, uh, so they, they actually had to compete to get one of five schools that were going to be built in New Orleans and they competed in one to, uh, to do it. But one of the things that they did is they actually negotiated with the state to say, we will control the design of the school. So they actually chose the architect um, and uh, they were the ones who actually worked with the architect on the program design for the school, for the, um, for the visual design for the school, et, et cetera. And uh, Latoya, 
Latoya Cantrell, once again, actually acted as, as the client. She was on site every day managing the contractors throughout the process and working with, with the architects uh, on, on the school rebuild. She's doing the same with the library, which is about to be, uh, open in about a month or two. Um, so the, the school, of course, uh, the state, uh, which uh, you know, was putting up the money for the school, uh, said, well, we'll only give you the technology that was in the school that existed, which was none. It was a New Orleans urban school. So Broadmoor went out and raised a million dollars to do the technology for, for the school. The uh, Wilson School, actually, um, the city of San Francisco helped in all of this, uh, helped them with this project. Um, the one of the partners in, in the, uh, with Broadmoor. Um, and today, the Wilson School has better technology than the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, this is the, the library, uh, library and community center. They said, we want it to be a hub of activity for the thing, not just a library anymore. We want to co-locate a, uh, a, um, a community center, uh, teaching, uh, kitchen, classrooms, uh, video conferencing facilities, um, coffee shop, et cetera, in the community center. Um, and we want to uh, do this. The city, of course, said no, and Broadmoor went off, raised two and a half million dollars from the Carnegie Corporation, came back, and the city said yes. <laughs> um, and the city, uh, and, Newer, and uh, Broadmoor signed an MOU, including What's amazing is actually that the library itself, this piece of it, you know, we've sort of se separate the function a little bit, but the piece of it that's the library, actually the branch manager is hired by Broadmoor to, works for the NOPL, but is hired through and managed by Broadmoor as, so again, all of the library functions tie back to the school functions, tie back to the, all of the, the sort of programming functions throughout the, the community. Um, and the last piece is of the education corridor is the, the Fine Arts and Mola Center, which actually just got funding approval, uh, and that is to have an auditorium, uh, health clinics. They actually have started health clinics and temporary facility and a mental health clinic, um, uh, among a legal clinic, et cetera, all kinds of, of things, uh, recording studios, dance studios, et, et cetera. Um, and I'll just sort of wrap up on this last one. One of the big things, issues, was housing and how do you get uh, housing redone. Uh, so one of the things that they did was work with the Church of the Annunciation, who gave over its rectory hall, this area here, into um, and redid it and into a uh, basically a hostel kind of thing. It's uh, beds for about 75 people to be able to bring volunteer groups through and then Broadmoor partnered with Rebuilding Together, which uses volunteers to rebuild houses. So uh, Annunciation supplied the, the lodging and food for all of these volunteers, um, and, uh, and then Rebuilding Together put them to, to work on, on the rebuilding of, of homes. Um, and uh, we've been able to both gut uh, all of those homes and then uh, rebuild many of the homes in Broadmoor, um, of which uh, uh, it's over, I think it's 13,000 volunteers have gone through and stayed in Annunciation Mission um, as part of this process. So it's tremendous use of that outside labor to, to work in, in Broadmoor and some of the groups through there. And the payoff is that Broadmoor is, um, is uh, one of the most recovered neighborhood of the 49 neighborhoods in New Orleans that uh, were were uh, flooded, Broadmoor ranks number five in uh, in its recovery rate. And uh, I think I've <laughs> exceeded my time probably. So uh, a little bit about about the the story of of basically resilience in in action. I have only scratched the surface. The story is far more rich and complex uh, and far more things like the Environu project that the Salvation Army has worked on in, in Broadmoor and with Broadmoor. Um, and that's the real key to, to resilience. It's not just one little thing or a, 
or here are the four steps to resiliency. It is a rich tapestry that has to be uh, created and fostered within a community. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Joyce for in, uh, inviting me here today and for Doug for being here. Um, the last time we were speaking together like this, we were in Chile at a symposium marking the one year anniversary since the earthquake and tsunami in 2010. And that was just one week after the disaster in Japan. So I was in quite an emotional state. Um, given the opportunity to speak to this crowd, I'd like to start by clearing something up. Um, now that there's a lot of discussion about disaster resilient design. Um, I repeatedly hear people confusing terminology in classes and in media and in publications. Um, within this uncertainty that we're discussing today, decisions are made based on how people perceive and evaluate their risk. Let's not kid ourselves. Disasters are constructed by us. We build the buildings, we build cities, Nature may provide the hazard, although not in all cases, but the ones that we're speaking of today, uh, storm surges, earthquake, tsunamis, but we create our own vulnerability, economical, political, social, and the decisions that we make on where we build and how we build is a multiplying factor. For example, when an earthquake hits, it has a release of energy, but the effect of that energy is different from when it travels through the hard bedrock and when it travels through the soft sediment. It's called basin amplification. What kind of sediment do you think we have here? We spend our time controlling the rivers, so we spend our time controlling the ocean, and we spend our time reinforcing our foundations because we're on soft sediment. It makes sense when we get our water and our river um, water from our rivers, and if our livelihood is based on agriculture or aquaculture. But not all of us live like that anymore, and yet so many of our cities are built on these geologically hazard environments. Moving a city obviously has its challenges, but we're often called upon to design new cities. While I was at OMA, I worked on countless competitions on new cities, and a number of them in China, which are often affected by geohazards. I'm sure all of you will be designing cities in the future, so please consider this as part of your site analysis tool toolkit, and please make recommendations to your clients. When you consider the effects of prevention, every dollar spent on pre-emergency safety planning saves four times that amount in post-disaster costs. This is according to a study in 2006 by the Multi-Hazard Mitigation Council. This doesn't even consider the obvious benefits of saving human lives. It seems like an obvious decision. But convincing people of prevention is challenging. I've worked on a project in Indonesia to build a tsunami evacuation park, and it's very difficult to convince people to donate their land, even unused land. So what is the likelihood of a tsunami coming in my lifetime versus the likelihood of a developer coming and buying this land for, I don't know, condos? When it comes to retrofitting buildings or changing street patterns, it becomes even more difficult, and the figures change. Yes, it still makes sense to make changes, but it's a lot more complicated when it costs a million dollars to retrofit your building. My point is not to discourage retrofitting. It's important and it's necessary, but that's not our field anyway. We're designers, and since it's so expensive and so difficult to make a case for cities and buildings that are already built, it's our job to embed it into our design work. And that's for new projects. Now, how this overlaps with the phases of reconstruction and re recovery, that's what ex disaster experts call the window of opportunity. And it's a terrible phrase, but memories fade fast. And so now is the time to embed this infrastructure into the city, both cities that are rebuilding, but also those that are nearby that are now aware of the challenges that they're facing. I'll bring this up again and I'll show them, I'll talk about it a bit more after the case studies. For my research for the preemptive design book, I've repeatedly traveled to a number of countries along the Pacific Ring of Fire 
to various stages of reconstruction to study interesting cases in which the design of the system or building overlaps, has this programmatic overlap, designed for everyday use as well as a design for emergency use. I'll show case studies, two from Japan and two from Indonesia today. Um, one from each that's planned from a more top-down approach, and one from each that has a more bot bottom-up approach, which allowed for two true partnerships to, um, to be created. So first to take you to Kobe. Um, I'm not going to go through all the statistics because I don't have a lot of time, but there was an earthquake in 1995, which most of you probably remember. Um, with a magnitude of 7.3. Um, Kobe's, uh, Ko Kobe's geography has a city sandwiched between the Roko Mountains and the ocean. So urbanized Kobe is a 30 kilometer stretch along the waterfront with a width of between two and four kilometers. Essentially that makes for a very skinny city. About 80% of the population lives in this part. And this narrowness greatly slowed the rescuers' access to the city as all parallel routes, the local roads, the highways, and the transportation lines all ran this way. And once they were blocked with debris, rescuers could not reach the victims. About 6,400 people died and 40,000 injured, and 230,000 were left homeless. But because of this lack of access, fire consumed 66 million square meters of land. That's over 400 and 36 buildings were built, burned. Uh, 436,000 buildings were burned, sorry. So what have they done since? This up here is the Mickey Disaster Prevention Park and Research Center. And the access to the city of Kobe, as you can see, is redundant and also perpendicular to the main infrastructure lines. This 202 hectare site in Kyogo Prefecture operates every day as a sports center and a firefighting academy. And yet each and every space transforms into another function during an emergency to choreograph rapid deployment of emergency supplies. Just to take an example of the stadium designed by AXS Sato Architects, the approach to the stadium is designed for truck access and loading docks. You can see that here. And then the interior field and running track is designed for supply distribution in an organizational base. In Kobe, right after the earthquake, there are many issues of some evacuation centers getting rice, but no pots and pans for cooking. And it was extremely discoordinated. Co there wasn't coordination in terms of the supplies. And so this is a centralized area for all of Hyogo Prefecture, where the coming in and going out redistribution takes place. The space underneath the stadium seats stores food, blankets, medical packs, blue tarps, temporary toilets, and the list goes on. This is an example of a Bosai Koen. It's a disaster prevention park at the prefectural level. When I spoke of the window of opportunity after the Kobe earthquake, many cities in Japan started preparing and building Bosai Koen. Kyoto, in particular, a neighboring city, which is not affected by the earthquake, has built several since 1995. Now this next precedent is on a completely different scale. This is the Matsumoto district in Kobe city, where 80% of the buildings were destroyed by fire. You see all that in red. When it's just earthquake, you see something more like this, where there's some green and some yellow, depending on which survive. But when there's a fire that spreads, then basically the whole area is destroyed. So the pre-earthquake seven meter road was blocked by debris so that firefighters could not access the site. After the earthquake, the district was informed that the road needed to be widened to 17 meters, but the community didn't want to widen the automobile lane because of concerns for increased traffic. So they formed one of the 70 due to new Machizukuri Kyongikai, which is the neighborhood development councils. And each of these councils were then assigned one city planner or an architect to discuss issues of design. And they designed their new street to maintain the seven meter automobile lane 
but then to add three meter sidewalk on one side and a seven meter sidewalk on the other side. And then one community member was then in charge of negotiating with each of the families for how the land should be distributed. Now, one particular area of six blocks did not want their streetscape to look like this, to just look like a fire break, which is all this is. So then they rerouted water supply from the Suzurandai sewage treatment plant. And this now acts as a secondary source should another earthquake, source of water should another earthquake damage the city's water mains, essentially doubling the chances of having water after an earthquake. Of course, there are other benefits to this as well. But because it was a precedent setting case, it took 160 meetings over six months, and finally in 2003, eight years after the earthquake, the Matsumoto Chiku Street was finally completed. I find these, as well as many more projects developed in Kobe after the 1995 earthquake, to be an inspiration of how we can build our everyday public infrastructure with the duality and dual use of disaster preparedness. Now to take you to Indonesia. Again, most of you remember the tsunami that hit in 2004. First, a uh, road infrastructure project. This aerial is um, before the tsunami. And essentially, because this road runs parallel to the coastline, all the people that were living in this area had to run at least 500 meters before they could start running away from the coastline. And this also was a very small road that at certain points along here were, was damaged. And so several people had to run all along here. So after the earthquake and tsunami, this is what it looked like. And then the Japanese International Cooperation Agency built in this road so that there's at least one other perpendicular road to the coastline for evacuation. And then the Japanese International Cooperation Agency built this three-story structure of an escape building. Now this stru structure is a little controversial because although it's been built and it is there for people to escape, they don't have the everyday use. They're not sure what to use it for. Now this next case study Oops, sorry. So this is the common view in Aceh. It was predominantly an NGO, re, predominantly NGOs rebuilt the landscape here. And many of them, especially the large ones, had their own cookie cutter method of, occasionally they turned them perpendicular, but essentially the same houses built over and over. The case that I would like to present is by Uplink. Um, it was a small, group of young architects that were working with an NGO that they call the scary NGO. Essentially, they were not involved in reconstruction prior to this, but they were the ones who coordinated the, um, the demonstrations in Jakarta. So they were really involved in the social aspects. And this was the first time that they got involved in reconstruction, but they hired a number of young architects and these architects lived with the community members and reconstructed 23 villages and 3,331 houses along the seven meter coastal area of Banda Aceh's coastline. So they started with mapping because essentially there were no maps of the area of these villages. Banda Aceh, the city itself, of course had a map, but all these villages along the coastline, they had to go by people's memory of that our building was over there, the community center was over there. And then they borrowed a total station survey from India and they started to catalog these um, and create these maps. Oops, wrong direction. This is Lam Isak, one of those villages that they created, um, they had to rebuild after the earthquake. And this is before, and this is after. Now, 
the precedents that they looked at in order to rebuild these homes, they looked at the traditional Achenese house. This is one of the very famous ones. Um, this is a more common one that you see built on, um, when you're driving down the road. This is what a lot of the houses looked like after the tsunami. So they looked at what portion of the houses were then demolished and taken away by the tsunami. And they also looked at what was standing, what was left standing after the tsunami. And although people really believe that it was the power of Allah that kept the building standing here, it was actually the redundancy of the columns and the fact that there's the triangulation in the corners. So when they started, they held a lot of meetings with the community members. And like I mentioned, a lot of these young architects then lived within these communities. And they talked about how it'd be really great if this space underneath wasn't just one or two feet above the ground, but really a space that they could use, that they could hang their laundry and things. So that was one improvement that they made. And then again, in terms of the construction, they added those corners. They added foundation work, which is often skipped by contractors. And then they built it so that the upper parts of the house were actually built from lighter materials and not from brick and concrete, and so by wood, and then taught how to stabilize the corners. And these were the houses that were built. You can make a comparison between that and some of the other houses built by the NGOs in the area. So what they did, though, is not just handing over these houses, but they trained the people that they were work, they were staying with to rebuild these houses with them. And so their th thinking behind this was that people are going to get receive these very small houses from the NGOs and then want to make additions anyway. So the best thing is to teach people to, so that they know how to do this in a safe manner. And they also found that if you hire someone to do it, there's a chance of corruption. If you have your own, the, own, the families do it themselves, then they really make sure this is their own home so that they build it correctly. They also found, compared to a lot of different NGOs that were handing out money, that money becomes an issue. And so they created cards for different materials. And people went and had direct connections to the suppliers and were able to get their supplies met with these cards, and it was never amount of money. And then they helped people set up small construction factories. Um, and this again, this was, this was uh, sort of the global trading of um, reconstruction hardware, but from India, they brought these uh, concrete and brick presses. And then these communities then started supplying the bricks for all the other communities in the area. So in, in a way, it was a large income generator for these people as well. And so this is an example of how they then helped them design their own. So for example, this is a family with, that was very close with the four families, and they built one larger one together. And then they started adding their own additions their own additions, and sometimes, sometimes not exactly in ways that they expected, but at least they were adding them with the knowledge of how to, to build safely. So I've been asked to talk about Japan. This is still a bit raw for me. Um, I'm going to go through it quite quickly. But I was fortunate enough to take a group of students to Japan this summer. Um, as you've seen, we owe the Japanese people for what they've taught the world in terms of disaster planning and disaster reconstruction. Um, and so when I speak about resilience, I always have Japan in my mind in some way. And it's really going to be a long road to recovery, but I have no doubt that there'll be many inven inventions along the way. Um, so since the 1995 earthquake, the Japanese con concept of bosai, the disaster prevention that I mentioned before, in research institutions, universities, and government agencies, nonprofit organizations, all been incredible. And also, these agencies have been the greatest contributors to international post earthquake aid. And so, it's so difficult knowing how much they contribute to the world and not being able to go there immediately to help. 
Um, as you all probably know, there were a lot of efforts here at the university. Um, the students created Harvard for Japan for fundraising. The Reichauer Institute set up an archive um, and several panel discussions. And then in the summer, three months after the earthquake, I was able to bring a team of GSD students, um, thanks to the Reichauer Institute, the Social Agency Lab, the Community Service Fellowships, and the Humanitarian Initiative. And we had an incredible team of people um, I just want to take you just through a couple of slides. I know you've seen a lot of this already on the news, but it was a really a shock as an architect to see buildings that we would build with the kind of construction that we would construct them in, including foundations, that which everyone usually blames. Like if you look at Ace, you can kind of understand that it's small buildings. A lot of them didn't have the right foundations. But you just see these large concrete buildings knocked over. And the sure, sheer force of the tsunami was really believable. And also the height. The height of the tsunami is still extremely difficult to get grasp our mind around. Now, we had an incredible team of people who helped us and educated us. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go through all of their contributions. But our partners in Japan stemmed from Professor Hiraoka um, from Miyagi University and um, Hiroto Kobayashi from Keio University, who is actually a GSD alum. And they brought their students, and we also had a team. Just to pull out a few of, the G of your GSD classmates, we had Kenya Endo, Sky Milner, uh, Stephen Fun, Yuka Miura, and Masa Watanabe, and Mina Nishio and Misa Odanaka were able to help us from here. And they couldn't come, but they helped us with research. So we were comprised of people who had lived in Japan in the past, or second generation Japanese with a father living in Fukushima, or half Japanese. Um, and that made us especially conscious just to how we would get involved. And we also had a lot of heated discussions because of this. We also had a mixture of planners, architects, and landscape architects, and so that brought on good discussions as well. So we approached the summer with two goals. Um, to research a planning and recovery strategy for Minami Sandikcho, and to contribute something physical. We had read and heard about residents being frustrated with all the universities, both national and international, coming through to do assessments and research and not actually contributing to the immediate needs. And so we wanted to give something back while we were there. Our site was the Utatsu district, and we actually stayed in the middle school here for the most part when we were working there. We spoke to a number of community members and proposed different ideas of what we could do while we were there to help support them. Some were planters so that they grow their own vegetable or just seeding or a shelter. And we had a number of, like Doug said, party type things to, in, or, in order to engage people, but also met with people who were formal leaders of the community, like Chairman um, Onodera and Principal Abe was the principal of the middle school that I just pointed to. Now we found when we were there that in the temporary housing, um, people were relocated there from different districts. So this town of Minami Sanikcho actually has four different districts that's separated by mountain and by water. And so actually they have nothing to do with each other. And yet the government decided to put the most vulnerable people first to prioritize them. So the lottery was based on the elderly and the young getting into community housing first. That meant that people essentially were next to others that they didn't know and they didn't move districts altogether. And, and it broke all the community ties. And so we found that they really needed a place to meet and get to know each other and a, and a space to do that. And so based on um, discussions with the middle school principal, we found a site here, which is halfway in between this community of temporary housing and this community of temporary housing. Now normally when there's 50 houses, um, the government should have allocated a community center, but since this was split on two different sites, they fell in the loophole and they didn't get a community center allocated to them. So since we had learned from the earlier projects that I showed, and since we were on the middle school grounds, we wanted to involve the middle schoolers in 
building of this project. And so we tried to find, and at the same time, we tried to find material that we could get for free. So here we found some local materials. These are offcuts um, that we normally go to a wood chip company. And we found this from a neighboring town of Tome. And we're, we're told that we could have as much as we wanted of this material. And then we looked for ways that the kids could con, um, combine them and work with us on it. Um, and we found that a lot of the local carpenters were really busy rebuilding, um, actually building the temporary housing. And so we went all the way to Kyoto to find some architects and uh, carpenters that could then help us. And they volunteered their time and came all the way up to work with us. And so they helped us build the main frame. Um, and we helped in every way possible in, in the construction of it. Um, but then the students, the middle school students, helped us essentially design the pavilion. They decided where the windows would go, and they also helped with the construction of the pavilion. And here you can see um, us working. And at night, we actually had a night shift of local carpenters that would come help us after their work was done. And of course, that led to many parties and drinking as well afterwards. But this was also a great way to get to know the people um, in the community. And this is the pavilion when it was completed and at night. And this was in the day 2,896 blocks later. This was it completed. Um, and this, so this was only one part of our project, and I don't have time to get into the second part, but essentially we um, made these panels that asked all the difficult questions about relocation, where people wanted to live, and what their thoughts were in terms of replanning these neighborhoods. And by keeping them up where we were building, so we were working right here essentially, and we had these hanging up, the people that would come by would just tell us their story, and obviously really heart-wrenching stories. But then look at our, sort of precedents and quick renderings to discuss what they wanted and what they didn't want and what they were really envisioning for their future. So these are all the people that we'd like to <laughs> thank, um, but I can't go through them all. So just to conclude um, on Japan and um, this, this in general, there are multiple issues facing Japan now, and we're discussing some of these in my class, but now people really want to relocate to the higher grounds. There are other issues that we have to look at, um, and one of them being landslides, and also how you help elderly then live in steep, sloped conditions. And since the government is quite slow in trying to figure out exactly where the funding will come from and how it will be distributed, a lot of people are starting to go to private developers. Now, um, the quickest and easiest way is really to cut tops of mountains and to fill, and that's what a lot of the proposals show. And obviously there are a number of environmental issues that then result from that. Um, and the other that really concerns me is how do you build on s these sloped conditions when you don't have a lot of experience doing that. Um, so the issue of prevention then, we, requires a lot more research on our part and how do we build communities like this. So this is just a map of all the cities along the Ring of Fire. I've been to a number of these. And there are a lot more. And over a billion people live along this coastline. So all the help and research is welcome. And I hope that as a school, we start to build a catalog of these preventative measures that can be applied and really start thinking carefully about how we can embed this in our design process. So I just want to end with one quote from um, Frederick Cooney, who wrote Disasters and Development. The current trend towards disaster preparedness activities will naturally lead to more interest in opportunities for disaster mitigation. Many agencies, especially those involved in both relief and development, will complete this cycle, realizing that the connections between disaster and development run also in the other direction, and that's development to disasters. The challenge will be to formulate development programs that include disaster mitigation as an integral part. As more and more poor communities are built in vulnerable environments, 
development agencies will be called upon to initiate programs to reduce this vulnerability and to simulate alternatives. The most important challenge will be to develop a broader understanding of the development disaster development continuum and the opportunities for mitigation. If this is done, we'll surely take the natural out of disasters. someone with a microphone. So thank you. Pass around if there's any questions. Let's um, collect them quickly and then have Doug and Miho address them. I have some questions if nobody else does. <laughs> Rebuilding, thank you, rebuilding in areas that are potentially going to be hit again. So for Broadmoor, you know, rebuilding in, in the same area. Um, just kind of the discussions that you may have heard, um, the preventative measures that they put in place, and, and your own thinking about that tension between rebuilding and disaster-prone areas. Um, yes, and it's, it's actually an area that I... I actually have mixed emotions because I have, um, I actually do believe in, and I think Miho and I both both believe that there are just certain areas that should not be built on, and that that uh, uh, that we really need to do more in terms of looking at risk. And um, the, uh, I actually believe though that communities, this sort of notion that communities are just ignorant of the risks that they, they face, I think is, is actually quite wrong, especially immediately after a disaster. People actually know pretty well both what the risks are as well as the, the impacts of, of the risk. Um, and uh, so I think it's a mistake for us not to engage the communities in those discussions. In fact, they're the ones who should be sitting around the table with experts on what the, the risks are to, to have those conversations of, of, about it. Um, and what's, what's really interesting is actually in many cases you find that um, uh, we actually see a lot of people who don't, do not want to come back to a disaster area that are actually overestimating the risk just because of, of what they've, they've been through. Um, so we actually see it both ways, people who just want to get back no matter what, et, et cetera, and some who have no option to, to do it. And part of it when you have those discussions with the communities about risk is you actually start to have the, the things of, sometimes you will actually find willingness of communities to relocate or, or, or move, and the ones that actually have successfully moved or re relocated, um, uh, what you find is their concerns, which never get addressed in the, the plans like the Green Dot Plan, is, okay, well, where do I go? And what about the, you know, what, <laughs> You know, how, you're saying I can't build here, but what does that mean? Where do I, you know, do you have a compensation plan for me that, that et cetera? So, for example, in New Zealand, we're actually seeing this now in, in Christchurch. There are um, a little over 6,000 homes. It's probably going to go up to 10,000 homes in the red zone that will not be allowed to rebuild. Um, and uh, What's really interesting is when you actually talk to the residents there and the, politi the local political representatives that represent those districts, the issue is not so much, there are those cases where, you know, truly I'm not going to leave, but a lot of the discussion is really much more around, okay, but what's the plan? Do you have, you know, is there fair and adequate compensation for the fact that, that you're doing this? And what's often interesting is, that those, like in that case, those decisions are being made in Wellington and they're being made um, 
uh, while they're may being made by geotechnical specialists, the problem is no one actually sits down with the community to find out, okay, what do you really need to do to be able to successfully move, and how, you know, how can can we do it? So it's it's about engaging the, the communities in that dialogue. Yeah, I think for the most part, the people that we spoke to in Japan are looking to relocate, and I think a lot of the political tensions are about to begin because it's the government is giving out funding based on a certain percentage of the town has to be willing to relocate together. And then when you have just one or two residents under that, then how do you start to negotiate that? So there is going to be a lot of complication. And actually, Japan's the first time I've seen so many people want to relocate. So many people don't want to live in the, the inundated lands anymore. And it was the first time, like in Aceh, they all built back on the coastline and many other places in the Indian Ocean tsunami, they really built back exactly where they were before. And this is the first time I've seen people want to move. Um, but it, it takes longer. The community process ends up better, but it takes much longer. And there are people who get frustrated with it. Um, Thank you. they witnessed uh, the negative effects, but uh, did you, for example, see uh, they're seeking uh, more, let's say, technical advice on building more resilient design that can be and survive the, the negative effects? Y yeah, absolutely. Right and, and if you notice, one of the committees was was the, the um, flood mitigation committee, which was extremely active in and sort of took two pieces. One became very active in uh, playing actually an oversight role in, an activist oversight role in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers plans and execution of, of the levy and the pumping systems, et, et cetera, because there was a sense that uh, so much trust and faith had been put into the uh, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that everything was fine and everything would be safe, and the Sewage and Water Board that handles uh, stormwater pumping. Um, and so now, uh, largely out of that Broadmoor committee, it's actually spun off into its own nonprofit that is a watchdog organization on, and it looks at every contract, every bid proposal that goes out for a piece of equipment or, or a contract, and, and, and it's engineers and, um, and um, architects, et cetera, that, that really go through this with a fine tooth comb. The other part is on the residential side, so part of it is, is that uh, thing. There's also very active, Bromer is very active in the Dutch Dialogues, which is a process in New Orleans to, and, and Mia who sort of talked about this, is to think about the way that we can actually live with water. Instead of trying to, to have all of these things that resist water, it's how do you actually incorporate design to, to live with water. So they've been very active in that process. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's a actually great thing, but it's got very little political traction with political leaders to actually make some of those things happen. But the other piece on residential things is uh, there are many things that one can do, including elevation of, of uh, the, the easiest is actually elevating of, of the homes. Uh, but then there are also uh, construction techniques, too, that one can do. One can take all the systems and raise them so that, um, you know, all, the, and actually if you go around Broadmoor, in many places in New Orleans, you'll go and see that all of the uh, the electrical systems, all of the HVAC systems, and everything are now elevated up above the, the levels. There are also design things that you can do in terms of of basically flood proofing of a place or materials that can actually weather and uh, weather floods or be easily replaced in modular modular ways. So there's a whole host of of things, some of which have have indeed made their way in. Unfortunately, uh, and Broadmoor really wanted to have, it knew that it would probably never get 100% in, in all this, but it really wanted to get elevation of, of the homes, especially when you have to rebuild everything and you, you want to try and elevate. Unfortunately, the funds for uh, elevation, which actually did exist, um, were tied up 
by the federal government for about three years before they released. And when they were finally released, everyone had already rebuilt their homes. So um, it's actually just a, you know, there is a case of worst practice in the way that government handled the program. And we could have actually, so Broadmoor ha now has probably 20% of the homes are, are mitigated uh, against a Katrina-like flood. And um, some of that is they actually had some homes that pre-existed, what we call raised basement homes that were originally built because of flooding. Um, but it probably could have been 50 plus percent in had the funds actually been there on, on time. Um. Okay, time for one or two more questions. Um, I've got a few. Doug, um, have you seen that the role of FEMA should change in terms of how they assist communities in recovery? Um, a very broad question, but I think really important for future events. And for MIHO, I've been wondering, are there any design standards that would really protect against an earthquake and tsunami of that magnitude, or will Japan consider relocation en masse from the coastline? So two different questions, but maybe I'd love to hear the answers. Um, well, I, absolutely on the FEMA front. Uh, for There are a lot of things that actually, there are a, a whole litany of changes to that, that FEMA can do, although most of them would have, will require reform of the Stafford Act, which is the, the law that, that, that governs it. And it's something that um, we've been advocating for, and a lot of a lot of people for the city of San Francisco advocates for. We, um, and uh, there's several things. One is actually making sure. You know, we just talked about mitigation monies and and having those available very quickly after, so you can um, you can do it. FEMA also administers the National Flood Insurance Program. Now that's only one one form of disaster. National Flood Insurance Program, there's a lot that they can do and on the mitigation in advance of a disaster under uh, the ICC program, um, increased cost of compliance. Basically, they know severe repetitive loss properties and they can actually do mitigation in advance around those through especially buyouts and, and things like that. And the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. But the Hazard, the hazard Mitigation Grant Program is $100 million nationwide to do mitigation and is nothing. It's just a drop in the bucket. Um, the other big thing uh, that I would love to see is block grants as opposed to, so FEMA goes in and does individual project by project funding of, so a library or a school or a fire station, each one is a project and each one is a negotiation with them. And instead of just giving, as well as the law, the Stafford Act says only, will only rebuild what existed which is, now there is money for if you want to do mitigation, but it's only, I think, goes up to like 15% of the project cost, which is not enough. Mm -hmm. but, um, but if you wanted to redesign something, like redesign a school or, or whatever, um, uh, FEMA makes that very difficult to, to do, and much better to actually give the, the monies in a block grant and let the communities figure out actually what's best and how to redesign a school or say, like we, in Broadmoor, we wanted to put a gymnasium onto the school because have the YMCA working around and, and things. And FEMA said, well, there was no gymnasium on the school before, so not only will we not fund a gymnasium, but we actually are gonna put barriers up for you actually trying to build it. Now we negotiated and worked it through, but the energy and time spent on negotiating that could have gone to doing 12 other projects. Thank you. Um, yeah, there was actually just an article in the New York Times yesterday, I think, on tsunami walls. Um, so that's the controversial point right now, that all, almost all these communities had tsunami walls and yet they were hit so hard. Um, but if without the wall, like so a wall, even if it gets overrun, it still uh, takes out about 80% of the tsunami's energy. So if you can imagine how much worse it would have been without those walls. But those walls are extremely expensive to build. And a lot of the community members also 
talked about how once those walls are built, there's this idea of that you're safe because the wall is there. Um, and so why spend that money on that? Um, right now, the proposals are that people will relocate. We really only heard of one town that they're not wanting to do that, relocate to higher ground um, in terms of residential and then industrial and uh, perhaps some tourism can be on the lower ground. Yeah. Well, thank you for... Um, one more question. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Those were absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm thinking about the social inequalities that pre-exist disasters and the fact that you know all these communities have marginalized groups within them. Um, it sounds like in Broadmoor there was really a concerted and amazing effort to bring together all of those different groups and have a cooperative process in which everyone had a voice. But so often I think the opposite is true and those groups are, are just further marginalized. So I'm wondering if, if you could just comment on how you think the recovery and redesign processes could address that uh, potential problem. Thank you. Um, the, well, you're absolutely right in terms of, of Broadmoor and, um, and it's true actually for m many of the neighborhoods of, of, of New Orleans and it's true for, for you know, we see it in Chile and some communities we're working in there too. Um, the, um, t t there's no simple answer to, to that uh, problem. I think what it requires though is it requires great sensitivity for the people, whether it's the community leaders in the community working, um, uh, as well as any outsiders working in, in those communities that have come in to have great sensitivity to that and to, you know, we spent a tremendous, and, and we, I use not the Harvard we, but I use it as the, we, uh, you know, at this point, the partners of Broadmoor, it's, I, I use we as Broadmoor <laughs> because it's it's so baked in that, that it is. But, but we um, in Broadmoor really bent over backwards to try and make sure that um, that it was an inclusive process, and it can always, there's always room for, for improvement, always, always. Uh, but really tried to, to bend over backwards and really tried um, to, uh, you know, to do the community outreach and the engagement and, and those, those things. Um, and tried to design the processes so that they really would be so half of you know I talked about the sub the subgroup things, but half of it was an understanding. Well, first off, it's not that it's a big; it's actually a fairly small neighborhood. But we also understood that people were not going to walk all the way over across the neighborhood to to come for for a meeting. Plus, we also understood that styles were were different. That that you know, and that people would be you know uncomfortable and, and things. But we also spent a tremendous, uh, you know, I, I didn't show them, but we have, you know, the, the number of activities around social things, of building the bonds, the social capital and the social cohesion in, in the thing. We put as much time as went into planning, and, and actually now over the last six years, probably 10 times as much into the social side of it as well because we understood unless you built trust between things, unless you built knowledge and, and relationships, you were never going to actually be able to truly do community-based planning that actually was representative of, of all the communities. The other thing, I, I, I mentioned the values and the importance of the values, and one of them, I've forgotten the exact words that, that it is, but is basically, oh, it's, it's the common good, um, that all decisions will be done for the common good. And this has been a driving principle of, of Broadmoor, because it's very easy to sort of say, well, you know, hey, if I send my kids to private school, why do I care about school or after school programs or things like that? I'm not, my kids are never going to go there. Or, or, um, or if you're on the other side, you say, well, I'm worried about getting shot walking out my door, or I'm worried about crime or the drug house down the street. And these other guys are talking about bike paths. And, you know, there's a, a disconnect there. And, the, but so part of it is to get people to understand that it's not just about their self-interest 
that it's about the, the community benefit overall and that, and actually we've done a lot of work to try and make sure that people understand, to frame it in terms of, well, what we do over here is actually, so a housing program, which where most of the housing is going on in the, the, the low income area, all of that work has a benefit to homeowners in the higher value area, but you have to work them through that process and why it is a benefit to them that property values go up it's a quality of life goes up, crime goes down, and you know, things like that. So, I don't know if there's a thing directed towards yeah. me. Um, in that um, sense, too, just to follow that up, did lower income households receive the first assistance for housing in that context? Did the poorest families? No, and, yeah. and, and so Bromer followed a fairly non traditional and not and a fairly controversial model which is so the sort of standard approach is the vulnerability model you know you score people so you're elderly you get 10 points you you know you're a single mother you get 10 points you know you, and et cetera, and that you use the, the the vulnerability index as the way that you prioritize how funds are, are done uh, which is sort of a triage approach to to things uh, in recovery, uh, we actually recommend a reverse triage approach, which is um, that you go for the low-hanging fruit. So, and, and this gets into a whole a lengthier discussion about sort of a, there's a whole tipping point model of how neighborhoods rebuild and whether one actually rebuilds or fails to, to rebuild. So you have the lower ninth ward, which has basically failed to rebuild, versus a Broadmoor, which is, has, uh, has, has rebuilt. And the, key is you have to get as much momentum behind the recovery effort as quickly as possible, which means you basically start with, let's get as many, it's basically the put your oxygen mask on first and then help the person next to you. So it's get the, as many people as you can, you t take the ones that are easiest first and get as many of them and then just keep working up the, the tree and the harder and the harder and, and harder. It's controversial because it, you know, oh, but they need it more. But the problem is, yes, but if you only actually end up, if you work on all the hard cases first and spend all your time and money there and get 15% of the neighborhood rebuilt, you never get, you know, you solve 15% of the thing and never recovered a neighborhood versus the other way you actually tend to. And what happens is the, the more as you go, the more recovery there is, the more resources you have to help people with recovery, both outside resources coming in, but internally, all of a sudden, people have the support systems built and the things to help other people through the, the process. That was a very interesting point to end on. With that, I have to thank you for your leadership and work in these areas, and I hope it's the beginning of many conversations we have in the school, so thank you so much. Uh,